Good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon, and thank you for joining me on a very special episode of Ask Sharifa videocast and podcast. I haven't done an Ask Sharifa video interview in some time, and that's primarily because, you know, I have to find some interesting stories and interesting people to bring to you, and that's exactly what we have done. We are speaking with Mr. Claudio Rosano today. You may recognize him from the Roundtable talk show. He was on the show a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month, and I was just so intrigued with his stories, and we didn't have enough time to go into it in depth. So we brought him here, we brought him back, we brought him live to Ask Sharifa Videocast. So if you're watching this show live, before I go ahead and introduce our guest, I'm just going to ask you to do what I always ask you to do, and that is to go ahead and share this show. Be an evangelist for Ask Sharifa Videocast, because friends don't let friends miss out on Ask Sharifa Videocast. So while you're sharing the show, we'll check in with our guest and see how he's doing today. Good morning, Claudio. How are you? Or good afternoon. Good afternoon. Well, it's night here, but everything is great here in Pittsburgh. A little cold, but uh, we're doing well. How are you doing? I am excited. I, I saw your bio. You have all these awards, accolades. But one of the things that we talked about when you were, were on the Roundtable Talk Show was your book. Can you tell us a little bit about your book? Well, it's called uh, Lead from the Heart Up, Not the Neck Up, How to Create a Positive Winning Culture on the Field and in the Office. I've been blessed to be coaching now going into my 38th year. Um, I've been head coach at Carnegie Mellon going into my 16th year and scouting professionally now for 21 years uh, this month with the Global Scouting Bureau. And um, I just thought that it's very important to me, Sharifa, to have impact on people. And I thought that this book would have impact on people, not just coaches, but as I said, people who own businesses or who are leaders uh, in the office. And I just wanted to share my experiences, uh, good and bad. Um, had a lot of great questions and questions that were given to me. And I gave, I think, good answers. And at the end of the book are about 27, 28 former players of mine who gave kind of like testimonials uh, about how my formula works, basically. So what is your formula? What's the magic? Dick Vermeil, the Super Bowl winning coach of the St. Louis Rams, uh, once said that your players or your people that are under, that, that work with you, work for you, they won't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So if you show people that you care for them, not just on the field or in the office, but just them as people, because they are people, they have, they have issues at home, they have bills, they have maybe some illnesses they have to deal with and care about that. Um, and, and mean it. And again, my mom used to say, never speak from the neck up, speak from the heart up. So when you talk to people, actually really do care. You know, I've had some, uh, this one guy in particular that I worked with, he wasn't crazy about me. I was his assistant and I wasn't crazy about him either, but I still try to do my job. But he was just, again, very cold, very distant with me. Then one time on a trip, we were heading to Florida, I believe. He started asking me about my dad, started asking me about my girlfriend, who now is my wife. I said, this isn't right. You know, in other words, he asked the questions, but it was from the neck up. He, he didn't mean it. You know, my players know that when I ask them a question, uh, I, I care about the answers. So it's basically, and it's also trying to provide a, a good culture, a good atmosphere. I don't want my players looking at their watch or looking at their clock and say, oh man, I got to go to practice at six o'clock and go see Claudio. No, I want them to say, man, I'm looking forward to going to practice. Nor do I want to say six o'clock, here comes, you know, John, I don't want to see him. I, I don't want that. So I want to create a good positive atmosphere and win at the same time. And you can do both. Claudio, do you feel that most people don't care that they just ask the questions as opposed to to really being concerned about what the other person is going through? I think everybody's so caught up in their own lives that, and I'm caught up in mine too, but I do try to care about other people as much as humanly possible. Um, I've had a lot of coaches that do care and a lot of people that I look up to that have had impact on my life that really do care. But like anything, you're going to have the good, you're going to have the bad. You're going to have some coaches, and I've seen it, and uh, it's just on the field. Uh, and I, I've illustrated some, uh, some, some points in my book about that, where this one particular young man comes into the office, and uh, he talked to the coach. It was around 830 at night. It was late night. We were all working pretty late. He said, Coach, can I talk to you a second? He goes, he didn't even look at him. He said, yeah, what, what's wrong? What do you want? 
he said, well, there's this girl that I want to ask out. And um, I really never asked a girl out before. And um, I was wondering if you could help me with it. And I'm sitting oh, maybe about 10 feet to the left of the coach in an angle. And he, he told the kid straight out. He said, "What my door says baseball coach, not personal relationships coach. And I said, damn, you know, that, you know, that, that, and the kid didn't really know what to say. And then the kid walked out. Then he said, as the kid was right at the doorway, he said, the symbol for, I forgot what, where the symbol came from, but he said, the symbol for success is the same as failure. And that was what he left the kid with. Yeah. So you couldn't have told him that you were dogged years ago by a girl and how you handled it or how you wanted to ask a girl out and how it worked or how it didn't work out. You couldn't have shared something with him and, and given him maybe a roadmap to help him out. I mean, he thought enough of you to come in here, you know, but that's the type of guy this guy was. Now me personally, I'm not here to sit here. I'm not sitting here screaming, telling you what a wonderful guy I am and pat myself on the back. I'm just telling you how I would have been and how I have been. And there are stories like that in the book where real quick, if you don't mind, one time we were having practice and one of my best players, and I don't care if he was my best player or my worst player or, or not the best player, but he was there and I titled it as such. He was there, but he wasn't there. So I went up to him and I said, well, you okay? He said, yes, I'm having problems. You know, my girlfriend and I got into an argument. I said, leave, go take care of it. He looked at me, his eyes got real big. He said, what do you mean leave? I said, go take care of it. Coach, we have practice. I said, I know we have practice. Go take care of it. I said, you're here, but you're not here. Your, your mind is over there. Go take care of it. Everything will be all right. You come back tomorrow and everything will be fine. And the kid shot off. He took off, right? To, and, and he always appreciated that. And he gave me even more of himself and gave more to the team than he gave before. And he gave a lot to the team before. He appreciated that I looked at him, not just as some player that may advance my career, okay? Or put another win in my pocket. No, I wanted, because I've been there. We've all been there, you know? And 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 I would want somebody, you know, the old saying, uh, do, on, do on to others, right? And, and I... I would want a coach that, to do that for me. And I had a coach like that in high school, Rich Wozniki. We became very good friends, best of friends. He gave my first coaching job. If there was something wrong with me personally, he was there for me. And I never forgot that. Okay. So do you believe that that just applies to sports or that everything in life or business? Because what, it, it reminds me of something I used to say when I was in management. I would always tell my team, if you allow your personal life to affect your work life, all that's going to happen is you're going to be unemployed. So I try to get them to focus and right. put, at, you know, because what happens is our problems teams tend to steamroll unless we focus on them and handle them. And I understand that's a great saying and I get it. And number one, it does apply to business. It's not just sports. That's why I said in the book, and I made sure that the subtitle was um, to create a positive winning culture in the, on the field and in the office, anything in life, you know, people are people. And I get what you're saying, but, and, and not to refute what you're saying, but at the same time, it depends what has happened to us personally. Mm -hmm. If we get a traffic ticket on the way to work, okay, we can shut that off. If we, um, you know, something happened that isn't that major of a deal, we can shut it off. But if there's a relationship problem or maybe a financial problem at home or maybe um, a passing of somebody a close, you know, it's hard. It, it's really hard for you to come to work, not just practice or a game and put that aside. Now, there have been many athletes. I remember Brett Favre, the uh, old quarterback of the Green Bay Packers. He, he did a Monday night football game and his father had passed away. I think that day, I, I'm almost positive it was that day. He had an unbelievable game. He turned it up and he just, I'm not saying he didn't think of his dad because he did, you know, but his teammates thought of his dad and they tried even harder and he tried even harder. So um, he, he didn't say, okay, my dad passed, let's go play the game. No, he still kept his father's memory and thoughts with him. Um, there was, there were games that I had, you know, like the first game, I have a game ball here, as a matter of fact, uh, 1989, my mom passed in 1988, but my first game after I, after my mom passed, which was several months later, a couple of my players remembered that my mom had passed. They said, we want to win this game for coach. And, but of course my mom was on that game, but I still did my job. Okay. But I, I thought about mom. So I think you can kind of do both, but it's hard. We don't have a switch. What we do have a switch. But 
again, for you, for somebody to just say, okay, I just got a divorce, or I just lost all this money, or um, things are bad, you know, you're probably are going to bring it to work, but somehow still try to do your job. And hopefully you have somebody that's a coach or a manager or in a CEO position, whatever, that is understanding, maybe brings you into the office a little bit and help, hey, let's talk about this. I see you're not performing as well. What's going on? Then they'll, they'll talk to you and then, you know, try to help people out because you know what? We all, I don't care who it is. We've all gone through hell, all of us. And uh, there's an old Italian saying my mom used to say all the time, uh, nobody has worn the shirt of the content. And it, it sounds better in Italian, but basically... <laughs> everybody goes through something mm -hmm. everybody I don't care who it is the most famous Michael Jordan okay arguably the greatest basketball player of all time his father you know the, what happened with his father was killed okay and you don't think he took that on the court and then when he won the championship that year he just collapsed and everything just hit him you know so it things happen to all of us and we just it's how you deal with it and hopefully you have people around you, not just family members or friends, but people that you work with. Hopefully they can help you out, get through that as well. And that's what I've tried to do. No, I, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. And I know that there are times when we need that. But it's, it's the patterns that I look at. And in management, it was always the patterns that people had that I looked at. Because people would say, oh, Sharifa, you know, the bridge was out. There was no way in the world I could have made it to work, you know, and they want to make you responsible for, you know, That's different. Them, yeah. them getting in trouble. But you like, OK, was the bridge out last week and two weeks ago and five months ago? Like we're, all of these things happen so we can understand the exception to the rule. But when this is a pattern of someone, how do you approach it then? that's when you got to deal with it. You know, you, you talk about a switch. And again, I, I talk about it in my book. You know, you, when it's cold out, like it here is here in Pittsburgh, it's about 20 some degrees here. You know what? You put a coat on, you put a jacket. When it's hot out, you wear a t-shirt, shorts. Okay. How dumb would I look if I went outside? It was 20 some degrees. As a matter of fact, today I saw a guy, I went to go get some uh, gasoline. There was a guy who had a short sleeve shirt on his shorts. I'm saying, damn, it's cold out, right? He didn't look too good. So we have to make adjustments in life. Whatever the situation calls for, that's what you do. This one particular guy, this one particular coach was mad. Well, he wanted to be a tough guy all the time. Not even a tough guy, just a hard guy. Okay. He just wanted to be that all the time. And sometimes you do have to be that way, but not all the time. Okay. Mm -hmm. So again, I think the situation dictates and the person, and the person, because I, like I said, I, I let that, that one kid, I told him to go take care of the situa situation with his girlfriend. First of all, he deserved that. He deserved that consideration from me because he was always a good guy, always respectful, great team player, gave me everything he had. Now, if he wasn't like that, if he was, if it was always Okay, one time, okay, two times. I mean, how many damn problems you have with this girl? You know what I'm saying? Is he, <laughs> yeah. trying, to, is he trying to get out of it? That's when you have to put, you know, the other, the t-shirt on or the coat on. You have to make your adjustments. You don't, so, yeah, I, like, I don't like to put a blanket on everything, right? Mm -hmm. So um, you take each individual situation as it is. Let the situation dictate and the person. Yes. Absolutely. But I just wanted to clarify that because usually when, when people think of, you know, lead with your heart, get, you know, give from your heart, we, we tend to believe that that person is soft or they'll just exactly. give anything away. And that's not what it means. It means to, to make, to discernment, I guess is what you were saying. You are a thousand percent right. People do think that, you know, I'll never forget my first year as a head coach. I was 23. It was 1988. And I remember going to the mound and kind of getting upset with the, with the situation, right? And I'm up there and I'm mad, right? And then as I walk off the mound, I see the, on the corner of my eye, I see my mom. Mm -hmm. And I blow her a kiss. So two seconds ago, I was, I was upset. I blew my mom a kiss, right? So no, and even with my team, my, I've, hey, and I'm not embarrassed to tell you. And again, there's stories about it that we can get to it later if you want. But in the book where I, I've been very emotional, I've cried, you know, uh, in front of my team. And I'm not embarrassed to do it because they brought it out of me. They brought it out of me, right? And now they know, but at the same time, like with my daughter, I love my daughter more than anything in this earth. She's, she'll be 20 in May. Um, we will 
we'll have, we'll have fun together. With it. But if, if she does, you know, something, but she doesn't do anything wrong. So let, let me, let me switch that. My mom, my mom, my, my daughter is the easiest girl in the world to raise. She really is. She's a blessing. But my mom, my mom was crazy about me. She really was. She adored me. But if I did something a little stupid, man, she, she made damn sure that I knew about it. And same with my dad. So you love, but you also sometimes have to correct or whatever the case is, right? Again, the situation dictates, but no, caring or, or, or being emotional. Um, Dick Vermeil, I mentioned him. He's known for being very emotional with his players and, and getting choked up and crying. But those players, but he's also tough as nails too. So um, again, be who you are. And, and like I said, uh, in, in the book, again, lead from the heart up, speak from the heart up, live from the heart up, uh, care about what you're doing and whatever happens, happens. But, but don't take, I always tell you guys, don't take my being nice, being kind or being emotional as being weak because it's the exact opposite of that. You consider yourself hard as nails as well? Yeah, when you have to be, when you have to be, um, you know, and, and, and in life, in life, you have to be. Um, now, if I had anybody try to take advantage of me as a coach, uh, to be very honest with you, off the top of my head, I can't think of an incident because mm -hmm. um, I tell them up front, very first day, what I expect, what I don't expect, right? Um, but some relatives have tried to nail me. Uh, and, and then, and to be very honest with you, I let them, I allowed it. And I'm not that type of person. Okay, I'm not that type of person. Um, I'm just not like Billy Martin, the former Yankee manager. And by no means, Shreve, am I some kind of a tough guy? I don't mean that at all. I'm just saying Billy Martin used to say, I don't throw the first punch. I throw the second 20. Right. <laughs> and that's that, that's how I am. Right. But with a few relatives that I had, they just never stopped and never. And I never fought that one guy. I fought back. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, both of them, the one guy, just, I, I quit talking to both of them. but. Um, and I never did anything to these people. I can look you dead in the eye, look in this camera. I never did one thing to them, not even in retaliation, but they just always kept, you know, my dad used to have a saying, hard dirt, soft dirt. You get a shovel and you go dig in the hard dirt, you're going to try one time and you're going to quit. Soft dirt, they're going to keep digging. I allowed it because I wanted a relationship with these guys, which was my mistake, my stupidity. And then finally, you know, I had to get up. So, so to say, I'm hard, you know, hard as nails or whatever. No, I, I'm a very sentimental person. I, I, I cry easily. I'm a very emotional person. But at the same time, you know, if you push me too far, like anybody else, you know, they have their, their, their limits. But, um, you know, again, I let the situation dictate. I always say, if, if you're good to me, man, I, we're going to have a great relationship. If you're bad to me, I'm going to stay away. But if you're even worse to me, then, you know, then you got to expect something back. Mm -hmm. But hopefully those things never occur. No, I can completely relate because people tell me all the time, they're like, Sharifa, when you go off, you go off. And right. I'm like, you know, I'm not going to change that. I am completely yeah. okay with that. I'm a completely nice, happy person the majority of the time. And I tell people I'm nice nine out of 10 times. Like I gave you nine times. Yeah, what do you want? Right. You know, that's a great line, Sharifa, that I think it fits you. Mm -hmm. And it's a brief time that we've known each other, but but I... I I obviously have a ton of respect for you, but Shakespeare had a great line. You tickle me, I laugh. You prick me, I bleed. There you go. It, yes. it, it's good to me, I'm good back. If you're not so good, you know, what do you expect, right? And um, so, yeah, that's a great line that I try to live by. And I think, I th again, back to the book, I think I included that in the book. If you tickle me, I laugh. You prick me, I bleed. Yes, but people always want to control how you respond to the actions that they take. I remember one lady was telling me one time, she was like, Sharifa, you know, you, the way you handle things and you don't, and she was like, that's just like, if someone hits you with a stick, you can't just shoot them. This was her example to me. And my response was at the point when they hit me with the stick, I can respond however I want to respond because they initiated this whole entire action. Back to Billy Martin. You th I don't throw the first punch. I throw the second 20. Exactly. And then if those people, you talked about patterns of those people, and, and I didn't, I'm not listening. I did not listen to my own advice mm -hmm. because these particular family members just would not stop. My, my parents, my, my dad was, I, I had the best parents in the world. I really did. I, I miss my parents. I, 
uh, I love my parents more than anything in the world. Everything I do, I try to honor my parents. I named my daughter Ida after my mom. I uh, constantly talk about my parents, right? There's an old saying, which I'm sure I said at the last show we were together. If you ever see a turtle on top of a fence post, you know he didn't get there alone. I would not have the life I have. I have a great wife, great daughter, great some great friends, but my parents were just, I wouldn't have the life I have without my parents. But my dad went through hell in his life. He really did. And, but he kept coming back, kept fighting, kept, and, he, and he provided a good life for us, right? But he had some family members. They were un unfortunately the same ones that, you know, busted my chops and they wouldn't let up. They wouldn't let up. And then he would get mad. And, and I used to hate seeing that because my dad was a great guy. But he was also, I, I said in his, his eulogy, I said, my dad was the softest, most kind man I've ever met. But he was also the toughest guy I ever met. So you have to have both. You have to be able to, have to be able to do both. Yes, be balanced. You don't want to be too nice, too soft, but you also don't want to be mad and angry all the time. I, right. You can tell, and I and I could tell when we when you were on the roundtable talk show before because you shared some quotes from your parents and you shared how much they mean to you. You have so many different quotes. What inspired you to put all this together? Your thoughts, your beliefs into a book. Well, first of all, the quotes come, my, my, if I dropped a pencil, there was a saying behind it, you know, there was an old <laughs> Italian saying behind it. And, um, but I just, things touched me, okay? Mm -hmm. um, people that I've looked up to. Uh, and, and those sayings are short, quick, brief, but they pack a lot of knowledge or motivation or inspiration behind them, mm -hmm. okay? I, I was fortunate enough to have one of my heroes on my show yesterday, uh, right before I had you on. You're a hero too. Uh, <laughs> you, I, like I said, I, I respect the hell out of you, all the different things you do. And I, I can't wait to, for everybody to listen to our show together. But Mario Andretti, and Mario Andretti had a saying, if everything is under, if you have everything under control, you're not going fast enough. In other words, yeah. like you, you do all these different things, right? And that always motivated me. So, but um to, back to the book, I, I just wanted to, so many people have had impact in my life. I can go on and on, both professionally, personally, and business-wise. And I just wanted to share my experiences with people, both good and bad, mistakes I've made as a coach that I've included in the book. And, uh, and, and the funny thing is, I've heard from some coaches, yes, and they said they were going to try to um, adhere more to some of the teachings out of the book, but also some businessmen that um, said, you know what, I'm going to try to be a little bit different. I'm going to try to be a little bit more understand. And that meant so much to me because I know what it was like to have Im be impacted by people. Now I kind of know what that's like because some people have said, fortunately, that I've been able to impact them. So, um, so hopefully they get something like that out of the book. What are some of the mistakes you made as a coach? Well, um, one particular story it was on my birthday, October 14th, several oh, years that's ago. that's my sister's birthday. October 14th, okay, yes. good, good day. <laughs> um, but we had a game that if we win, so Carnegie Mellon, if we win the game, we were gonna have the most wins ever at CMU. And that particular team really deserved that title or that record or that number. They were just, and I'm, I've always had great groups, but this team, you know, this was like our first really good team, right? So I wanted to win the game for them. And I heard them, the guys in the bed say, hey, it's coach's birthday. We got to win the game for coach, right? Well, we were down eight, nothing. And then I heard them say, man, we're, we got to win. And then they made this big comeback. We tied the game up, right? So there's all kind of emotion going on. I'm very emotional, my coach. And, and that kind of rubs off on the team, right? So I have something that a coach usually doesn't have time to do, and that's time to think. Mm -hmm. There was going to be a pitching change. So the kid just got a big double. He's a second base. He drove in the tying run. We get one more run. We win the game. It's a home field. We're at home, right? So the coach goes and makes, makes a pitch, pitching change. So I bring the runner over. I say, okay, Brett, here's what we're going to do. If the balls hit the left field, I'm sending you because he has no arm. And the ball is a little bit wet. I'm going to send you. If it goes to center field, I'm sending you, and we're going to win the game. But if it goes to right field, I will not send you no matter what, because he's already thrown a runner out. He's got a cannon for an arm. 
He's playing up. They were all playing up, especially right fielder. There's no way I'm sending you home. You got it. Yeah, coach, I got it. I said, Brett, listen to me. If it's hit to right field, I'm not sending you. Stay here because we have the leadoff hitter up next, number two hitter, number three hitter. We're going to win the game. Let them win the game. You're not going home. You got it. Yeah, coach, I got it. Okay. All right, take it back. The leadoff hitter was batting, then the number two hitter. But we had our best hitters coming up, right? So Brett's the second base. So where was the ball hit? Right field. What do you think I did, Sharifa? I sent him. I told him to go. I just told him not to. And I, and I sent him home. He got thrown out by a mile. The catcher had to go get him. That's how, that's how far he was thrown out. Then the guys, I can still see them getting their gloves and their hats. They didn't get mad at me. They said, we'll get him, coach. Don't worry. We got it. No, no. As soon as he was thrown out, I say, hey, guys, I screwed up. Get me out of this was my exact words. I said, don't worry, coach. We'll get him. Well, we didn't get him. We lost the game. So I remember as is custom, we always go down the end of the, the left field or right field line to do our post game meeting speech, whatever. So they met down left field and usually I run down. Well, this time I didn't run down. I walked because I blew the game. I, I, it was my fault. They made this big comeback and I blew the game for them. So, and I wear sunglasses when I coach and I'll never forget. I put my head down and my hands on my knees and I looked at the ground and my sunglasses were catching my tears. Oh. I told guys, I screwed up. I'm sorry. You guys deserve that record. And I blew it. And I said, I'm sorry. My pitcher said, John, he said, coach, if I had a pitch better, we would have won. My catcher, Brian said, coach, if I would have gotten that hit with the bases loaded, we would have won. My shortstop said, coach, if I didn't make that error, we'd have won. My center fielder, James said, coach, if I had gotten that ball, we'd have won. If I was bad with them, they just said, good for him. You know, when they would have made a mistake, I said, what are you doing? You know, no. So that goes back to being good to people. Yes, I, I got on. I corrected them if they made a mistake, but I didn't embarrass them because eventually you're going to make a mistake as a leader. But that was one of the mistakes. And, you know, there's other things, you know, in the book that uh, are, are similar to that, similar to that. Um, one time real quick, we had a we had a player who this is my first year at CMU. And obviously you want to establish your credibility and who you are and what you are, what you want, what you don't want. There was a kid who had a pattern, ironically, like you said, who was always late, always late for practice, for games. Now, I don't like being late. OK, I'm always way early, but it's at CMU. The, the classes are very demanding and I'm very understanding, not lenient understanding that these guys are up at two, three in the morning doing their homework. You know, so we have an early practice. They're going to be late and I'm fine with that. Or they have labs or whatever. So anyway. This one kid was always late. And I said, look, if you're late because of school or because of something, he said, and he wasn't, he was on. I'm just late because I fell asleep. I said, that's it. You're not going to be late anymore. I've had it with you being late. You're not going to be late the rest of the season. Coach, I promise you. He was about six foot four. He looked down at me. He said, coach, I promise you, I will not be late anymore. I said, okay. He said, no, no. Said, coach, I promise you. I'm, I, you're right. And I wasn't trying to take advantage of you. And it's just, you know, me, how I am, but I'm not going to be late anymore. I said, okay. So the next morning we have a game and we were supposed to meet at the gym at nine o'clock. I'm there at eight. He was there about like eight, 10. Oh, wow. Dressed, dressed. I'm ready to go. Right? I said, thank you. I said, I appreciate it. No coach, no, no problem. Then, you know, guys start coming in. Everybody's coming in. And then all of a sudden I see this, this player of mine, this kid dressed with a polo shirt and khaki pants and a backpack. I said, okay, now he's trying to, he's trying to test me. He came here early. He was dressed. He was here before everybody. And now he's going to take the time to go get undressed and put his school clothes on. I lost it. I saw him in the hallway. I shot over to the hallway, Sharifa, and I got on him. I said, don't you, and I lost it. I really did. And, and everybody's looking at me and there's this kid six foot four. He's just staring at me. He's had these glasses, curly hair, and he's staring at me. And he doesn't say a damn word, nothing. Then for whatever reason, Sharif, I went like this. I looked to my left. There was my player. He had an identical twin. Oh, wow. I was wondering <laughs> the same thing. Like, I'm why did he kid. I'm <laughs> hard. This kid who doesn't even go to school there. He was coming there to see his brother. And here comes this, this short Italian guy hollering at him. He's like staring at me like, what the hell was this guy up to, right? But that's another one of my mistakes. So if you're going to holler at somebody, make sure you holler at the right guy. 
<laughs> but at least they were twins. You know what I mean? It wasn't I somebody I, completely different. And my team started, they, they, they could have stopped me, but they did. They let me make a fool of myself. And they, they were cracking up over it. But that's in the book, too. So that's one of the lessons. If you're going to holler at somebody, make sure you're hollering at the right guy. <laughs> yes, I love it. Now, I want to go back to when you lost the game, the tears rolling down your eyes in the glasses. Do you take your losses home with you? or And how do you shake them off? Um, great question. Um, take them home in the sense of, does it affect my family? No, mm -hmm. no. I mean, I'm totally drained, you know, like, I, I, but we'll still go to dinners and, and I look forward to, to, you know, dinner, either if my wife cooks here, if we go out or something like that. So no, and, and but it, it bothers me, but I don't take it out on them. You know, mm -hmm. I've heard a lot of coaches and that's fine. I'm, I'm not, you know, that's up to them. I can't tell people how to be, but, um, but when I'm alone, you know, you think about it, you think about it. You think, and I'll be honest with you, the, the two years, for example, I'll give you the two years, 15 and 16, when our, our CMU team won our conference championship or in 1990, when my team at Penn State Beaver, when I was head coach there for the year, uh, we won a championship that year. Those were the three years that I was actually sick that I got sick and we were winning, we were winning, you know, that I actually had to go to the doctors. I remember in 90, I was getting dizzy spells. Oh, wow. Um, and I said, oh my God, you know, what's wrong with me? Then in 15 and 16, um, again, I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't eating and we were winning. Okay. But um, so again, I, I, when you lose, it always stays with you, but I never like lock myself in a room and don't talk to my wife or daughter or my friends don't call me. I don't do that. No. And again, everybody handles it their way. That I, I don't handle it that way. What's that going to do? Um, I try to figure out why we lost. Go fix it, and let's go. You leave it there. Don't don't take it back into your world. Let's talk about. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, 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 again, when it late at night, when my wife and daughter are in bed, then maybe it'll rumble in my head a little bit more, or I'll lose some sleep. Okay. But one thing that I've, I've done, matter of fact, I just told my friend this about an hour ago, you know, I read a lot of, like you, I always, I'm always trying to do more and always try to get better at what I'm doing, right? I'll read financial books, investment books, or, or business books, right? Um, but I noticed that when I do that at night, it gets the brain going and, and like I'm all wound up, right? So then I stopped doing that. Mm -hmm. So then what I do is I watch old wrestling, professional wrestling from the 70s and 80s, that kind of relaxes me, kind of gets my mind off of things. And then I just crank it up the next morning. Yes, it's beautiful to be able to release things and just let them go. Too many right. people carry on arguments and carry yeah. on fears and losses. Yeah. When you, you just want to say, let it go. Exactly, exactly. Let's, let's talk about your shows, Claudio. Oh, okay, good. But no, I was like, what, what shows are you doing now? Well, I do a couple TV shows. Um, one is uh, Pittsburgh's Ring Talk. The other one is Steel City Sports World. And the other one is um, Pittsburgh uh, Steelers pre-snap show, uh -huh. which is a Steeler game. And the Steel, uh, Steel City Sports encompasses all Pittsburgh sports. And we talk about other sports. And Pittsburgh's Ring Talk is a boxing show. And uh -huh. the two guys I do the shows with are unbelievable at what they do but they're even better people. And mm -hmm. that's Luther Dupree Jr. and Smoking Jim Frazier. Mm -hmm. These guys are, you know, when I'm sure you've had it and I have it, we all have it by watching the show. Whenever you get a phone call and you see that name, it's, oh man, I don't, I don't want to talk. You know what I mean? We all have those type of people. And, and like doing your show today, I couldn't wait to do the show today. It took like forever for 7.30 to come because I think mm -hmm. so highly of you. Whenever I'm doing a show, you're very welcome. Whenever I do a show with Smoking Jim or Luther, or if I know I'm going to see them, I'm just in such a good mood because they're just great people. They're, they're great hosts and, and co-hosts. We have so much fun. And anybody, if they see us on TV, yeah, they can see that we get along, we have fun. But when, they, when they're on my show on the podcast, when you don't see them, you can see that we're, we're close and we have fun together. And, and I just love those guys. And, and then, of course, my podcast, which I've been doing now for about two, well, 100 and you are episode number 107, I believe, or 106. Um, so it's been going on for about two and a half years. And um, it is, I love doing it. I have a great producer, Adam Zalouf, 
and the listeners have been great, give me nice comments on the show. And then I've been able to, um, I, I live in the same house I grew up in, okay? Oh. So the room that, this is kind of interesting story. Um, the, the room, my office now is my old bedroom. Oh, wow. And I was interviewing a guy named Jerry Cooney, who's a, who's a boxing icon. Uh, I interviewed him in the same room that I watched him fight and knock out Ken Norton back in 1981. Okay. Wow. And I said, wow, I'm interviewed. And, and I mentioned Mario Andretti the other day, or I interviewed him yesterday. Well, I'm looking at the room that my mom, when he, I was four years old when he won, you know, she was all excited when he won. Here I am interviewing him, you know, it's so it's weird. So I'm interviewing and I've become friends with a lot of these guys and that's kind of strange, but um, I don't, I never use the word cool, but that it's cool, you know? And, and um, so I enjoy doing the show and the, the premise of the show is I, I want to like, I've expanded from just doing, you know, the sports legends of the seventies, eighties and nineties. I interview a lot of friends. We talk about sports, um, sports topics of the day, or, you know, things we grew up with. I had you on and we talked, it was a business interview, which I really, really enjoy that. But like, for example, Jerry Cooney, everybody knows that his, his two biggest fights were Ken Norton when he knocked him out in 54 seconds and his big championship fight against Larry Holmes. Everybody knows about that. But do they know about his grow, his childhood growing up? Do they know about his after career life? Okay. Um, like with you, what's the first thing I asked you? The 17-year-old Sharifa. Okay. Yes. So people don't know that. So then maybe they've gone through some of the things that you went through or Jerry went through or Mario and Jerry went through and they can relate to that. And they'll, they'll listen and they'll be motivated by where that person came from to where they're at now. And so these are questions that like, like, okay, whatever happened to this guy or what's he doing now? Like we know about their career. All you have to do is look at their, their baseball card or their boxing record or whatever, and you know what they've done. But I'm always interested in what they've done. For example, I'm, I'm into because I'm in sports, so I'm into athletes who have done well in business. Okay, mm -hmm. Magic Johnson, everybody knows, you're an unbelievable basketball player. But do they know how successful of a businessman he is? Do they know how successful? Well, I think they know George Foreman with the Foreman Grill. But, um, uh, or, or Jerry Cooney, do they know that he was involved in horse racing? Do they know he has a, a, a Sirius XM radio show? Uh, yeah, XM. Do they know that he owned minor league baseball teams? Or my favorite businessman greg norman who i'm wearing his i always wear his stuff he as i mentioned to you he's obviously was one of the greatest golfers of all time but he owns a uh, wine company clothing line golf course design beef uh you know, it goes on and on and on so um uh, that's just uh, mario andretti like i said he's done what well, he has a winery as well he, he he's involved with um does a lot of uh, work for some of the sponsors like Firestone and things like that, Magnaflow. He owns a petroleum company. So Greg Norman said, I'm not always going to be the number one golfer in the world. So I want to prepare for that. So I was always into that because yeah, I've been lucky. I've been coaching for 38 years, but you just never know, right? You never know. So I'm trying to prepare for that day when I'm not coaching anymore, which hopefully will never happen or scouting anymore. So it never happened. But so those shows, the Pittsburgh's ring talk, which you can Pittsburgh's ring talk, Steel city sports world and um, uh, Steeler pre-snap. You can see on sc.sportsworld.com. That's sc.sportsworld.com. And you'll, you'll love smoking Jim and Luther. And then my show, the podcast, you can see it on my website, uh, Claudio Relsano.com. And I've had great guests on such as yourself. I've had, um, as I said, Andretti, Ken Griffey Sr., uh, Roman Gabriel, um, uh, I, I can go on, uh, you know, some, some, some great names, Jerry Cooney, as I mentioned, uh, Rocky Blyer has a great story. Um, so I've had a lot of uh, great, great guests on. Where can people tune in? On my website, uh, ClaudioRelsano.com, and it's also available on Stitcher, iTunes, and Spotify. Uh, those platforms. Um, and then I'm doing another show with a lady named Barbara Fairbairn. Um, we are working on a title. She's out of Florida and I'm going to be here in Pittsburgh. So we're going to be kind of doing where you, what you and I are doing, a split, a split screen, doing a podcast TV type thing. And I've done a few episodes with her and uh, a few pilots, I guess you could say, they've gone very well. And uh, so I'm enjoying that too. So I've been very fortunate, very fortunate. So what are you going to be talking about on the new show? Sports? 
sports, sports <laughs> guy. Um, and then, and then I, I have a feeling we're going to be talking about how warm it is in Florida and how snowy it is here in Pittsburgh, right? I'll be dressed in a turtleneck and a, and a, and a you know, a vest, and she's going to be wearing a t-shirt. So, uh, but you know, it's going to be fun. And obviously, last uh, we had the show Monday together, and we talked about the the, the Super Bowl with Tampa, obviously, uh, in Florida, and everybody's all wound up about. Uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So, um, so it, it'll be fun and it's, uh, it'll be a good show. I'm looking forward to doing it. And I appreciate her wanting me to, uh, to be on the show and uh, where to watch the show and all that kind of stuff. I'll be able to post that up on my site soon as well and on social media. Mm, I'm looking forward to it. Now, Claudio, we are coming down to the last few minutes of the show. And what I love to do at the end of every show is just simply allow my guests the opportunity to speak directly to the audience, to everyone who is watching the show live, as well as everyone who is watching it in the archives, and let them know what you want them to take away from your appearance here today. First of all, that went quick. That went incredibly <laughs> quick. And I, and, that's, and I love being on the show with you, and I appreciate the opportunity. August 19th, 1973, I was eight years old. I went to my very first Pittsburgh Pirate game. My parents were from Italy. They didn't care about baseball. They liked boxing and soccer. So I was introduced to baseball. My uncle used to work at Three River Stadium. As I approached the stadium, I saw this big, beautiful building. I said, man, what is this, right? He takes me inside the stadium, takes me in a place called the Allegheny Club, which is where he worked. He was an assistant manager there. And I'm seeing all these athletes. So I didn't know who they were. I just knew who Roberto Clemente was. And then I see the field. Then he takes me on to down to the locker rooms. And I and these big guys wearing these beautiful white pirate uniforms, like they look like giants to me. Again, I was eight years old. And they're talking to me and they're asking me questions and they're having fun. They're laughing. And then I snuck onto the field up this ramp and I was by myself. And there's more to the story, but I don't want to make it too long. I, I go up this ramp. It's about a 60,000 60, seat arena, 58,000 or a stadium, 58,000 seat arena. It was empty. The only people that were there were me and the grounds crew. And I'm looking around and I'm saying, wow. And something was going on with me. Okay. And I liked where I was. Now, then I, this was before the game even started. Then I went to the Allegheny Club, and I, which was basically a restaurant inside this building so you could watch the ball game. So, that day, the starting pitcher's name, well, let me say, I came home and about 10 feet from where I'm standing right now, my dad asked me if I had a good time. And mm -hmm. I said, I did, but I think I know what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. He said, what's that? I said, I want to be in professional baseball. And he simply said, okay, I'm looking at the spot. He said it. He said, okay, if that's what you want to do, then me and your mom will do everything we can to give you every opportunity in the world to make your dreams come true. And he gave me a hug. And my mom, I can see where she was standing. She gave me a hug. And she told me as long as I was a good boy and all that kind of stuff, right? Now, go back to the game. The starting pitcher, his name was Jim Rooker. Jim and I are good friends. Um, we play in celebrity golf tournaments together. He's done some scouting for us. The first baseman's name was Al Oliver. Al Oliver and I are friends. He and I were inducted into a Hall of Fame a few years ago together. Rennie Stennett was the second baseman. He invited me to the Pirates 1979 Pirate Reunion, World Series Reunion, uh, two years ago. Yeah, yeah, two years ago. And then the left fielder's name was Willie Stargell, and I won a Willie Stargell Lifetime Achievement Award. Now, if you would have told me back then, at age eight years old, hey, kid, come here. These things are going to happen to you when you get older, or you're going to do an interview with Mario Andretti, or you're going to know Jerry Cooney, or you're going to play golf with Rocky Blyer, or you're going to know who Ken Griffey Sr. is. I said, what are you talking about? You're crazy. But they happened, Sharifa. So my, my message to the audience is things can happen in life. Things can happen in life. If you work hard, okay, stay focused, okay, and give it everything you have. And when you get knocked down, because you're going to get knocked down, you get back up, things can happen in life. There's nothing special about me that these things have happened, you know, good things. I've had a lot of hell in my life too. My, both my parents passed and then other things, you know, be it my fault or other people's fault, doesn't matter, things happen in life. But there's nothing special about me that, that these things happen other than I was persistent. And so that's, and, and things really can happen. So, so believe that things can happen in life. And, and, and that is Sonny Bono, the old, uh, you know, Sonny and Cher guy, he used to say, Believe in magic because magic can happen. I know because it happened for me and, and magic has happened for me. 
Well, you know what, Claudio, I would disagree with you. I think you are pretty special. And one of the things that I really think that is special about you is that you're positive. Every time I speak to you, you're very positive. You're, you like to lift people's spirits. And I believe that's pretty special. I believe that that's a gift. We always need that person to look up to, to help us when we don't know what to do, or, you know, maybe we're feeling down. So I think you're wonderful, Claudio. I enjoy being on your show. I enjoyed the conversations that we have, and I enjoy just hearing more of your stories. Now, I just want to thank you for being today's guest on Ask Sharifa Videocast. And I also want to thank everyone who tuned in to watch this show live, as well as everyone who is watching it in the archives. I definitely appreciate your support. I appreciate you for sharing the show. But what I always ask is please support our guest. Claudio is here today to share his story, his book, to his shows, his podcast, a million things that Claudio is doing <laughs> to benefit you. So support him. His link, his website link is in the Facebook post. Now, if you're interested in more ways that I can help your business, or maybe you want to be a guest on Ask Sharifa Videocast, please visit my website at AskSharifa.com. Until next time, everyone have a safe and a blessed day. Bye now. <laughs>